Welcome back to my animal education series. Today I'm here with John Crawford at the National Great Rivers Research and Education Center. Hello. How are you doing? Doing good after that really long name. <laughs> It is long. You can refer to it as the Great Rivers Research Center to shorten it up a little bit if you'd like. And that's what I will do. Absolutely. So, what all do we have here today? We've got eight different species of salamanders. Um, these are all native to Illinois. Uh, they have different ranges throughout the United States, and so we can talk a little bit about that uh, if you're interested. Um, and they are in four different what we call life history, or three different life history strategies. So we have um, some pond breeders here and down here, which we'll get into. We have one completely uh, land salamander, so it doesn't require uh, ponds or streams. And then we have two stream salamanders. So we can start wherever you'd like. Let's start by introducing some of the species that we do have here. Absolutely. So let's start down here. We'll start with the pond breeders. Uh, this first species, this is the spotted salamander. This is Ambistum immaculatum. And so this is a juvenile. This is a small female. These guys would be, these, these animals would be found in high quality uh, deciduous forests, so oak hickory forests uh, in Illinois. You'll find them in southern Illinois, east central Illinois, up into the Chicago region. Um, you do not find them in prairie areas, only the forested areas, and they require uh, seasonal and semi-permanent wetlands for reproduction, which means no fish. If there are fish present, they will not use those wetlands. They can actually chemically sense the presence of fish and they'll actively avoid uh, those, po those ponds. The reason being the fish will uh, prey on both the egg masses that they lay and the larvae that might hatch out. And so you would get very little survival for these guys. So these are really, really indicative of nice, high-quality forests and the associated wetlands. That you and have. the pattern too is yeah, they're really gorgeous. Cool. So one of the things you'll notice about the pattern on these guys up on the head, it's uh, orange spots, and then it transitions into basically two rows of yellow spots. Uh, one of the common things that can occur for people is that they'll confuse this with the tiger salamander and bistum to, to grind them. Tiger salamanders will have completely yellow dots, but it's in a uh, random pattern on the body instead of this, this basically two row pattern. Now, not all spotted salamanders will have orange on their head. You can notice this, this juvenile here. Uh, it's, it's a little Seems bit more, more yellow. yellow. That one. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but again, the dead giveaway to, to dis, uh, distinguish it from the tiger salamander are how the spots are arranged. Tiger salamanders are also uh, more often found in prairie type areas, and whereas, again, those are forested animals. So the second species we have in here, it's gonna be found in the same genus. This is Ambistema opacum. This is the marbled salamander. Uh, and it gets its name because of those bars that run across the back. Now, the males and females are what we call sexually dimorphic, and so they look different. We know this is a female because you, you'll notice these bars are really, really dull gray. The males will be really bright white. Uh, the, so the, the bars on the backs are completely uh, uh, different colors so you can discriminate the, the two uh, from one another. Now, Ambistum opacum also uh, needs high quality forests, so oak hickory deciduous type forests with those small ponds, but the difference is they need dry pond basins in the fall. They are not an aquatic breeding species. And so the females will go into the dry basins, they'll lay the eggs uh, in that dry basin, and they will guard them until the rainfalls come along and start to fill the pond. Once that happens, the female will leave and those eggs then will start to develop. They will not start to develop until they're inundated by water. And so if the pond doesn't fill over the winter, and it freezes, that's okay. The eggs will still be fine, and then the spring rains that would fill that pond will trigger the eggs to develop. Now, if that pond doesn't fill at all after the fall and the spring, those eggs then will no longer be viable. And so you, you have this trade-off where they are the first into the pond, which means that their larvae are gonna have more to eat as they grow and develop, but if that pond never fills, the eggs never hatch out. So a different strategy than what you have with something like the spotted salamander, which would breed in the spring and lay their eggs in the pond in the, in the aquatic habitat. 
The last two species we have also the same genus. So again, all of these are found in, in Illinois. This is the mole salamander. Uh, and so you can see it's got that big, broad head, even though it's relatively small. So this is a juvenile that just came out of the pond. So he'll grow a little bit more before he's ready for reproduction. And then we have the smallmouth salamander. And it gets its name because you can see its head is pretty tiny. His head, bigger body right now, smaller head when compared to that mole salamander. Um, again, the Embistema uh, talpoidium, the mole salamander, going to be found in those oak hickory uh, forests. They're really, really common in the swamps of southern Illinois, and that is their range limit. So you won't find these um, anywhere outside of southern Illinois. The smallmouth salamander is found throughout the state. It is more of a generalist, so it will use both uh, forested habitats and prairie habitats. Uh, it's more dependent upon high-quality wetlands uh, that are fish-free. They, they do not do well with fish, which is the case for most of them. See, most amphibians don't get along with That's fish. true. And so the, the amphibians that do get along with fish usually have some type of strategy to cope with that. So if we think think about toads, for instance, toads are toxic. Yes. And so the fish are going to leave them alone so the toads don't really care if, if the, the fish are present. And so that's pretty typical where the amphibians that can persist with fish usually have some type of, of life history strategy to deal with that. The ones that don't are the ones that will either avoid ponds with fish or their populations will decline. So you said these are the, the pond sounds. Those, these are the pond, the last one we have for pond breeders. If we come down here, this is the lesser siren. And lesser sirens are interesting. This is a per permanently aquatic salamander, so it's always going to be in the water. The other thing that's really cool about these guys, no back legs. And so if we look at the body, it looks more like an eel uh, or a fish, basically than it does a salamander. But if you look up front, underneath the gills, you'll see these little, 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 little legs. And he uses those to kind of move around a little bit. But the the sirens are really cool in that they've got this, this kind of spatula, shovel-shaped head. And what they do is they use that to dig in the mud of swamps and ponds, uh, places that they reside to pop up food that they're gonna eat. So crayfish uh, and other types of aquatic macroinvertebrates. Now, they are completely dependent upon water, but let's say the pond dries or the swamp dries. Well, that's not the end of the world for the siren. They can actually make a small mucus lined cocoon and they can survive in that cocoon for a couple of months. And so even really? though, even though yes, they, they need the, the water uh, primarily, you see the gills that are flared on his head, they can gulp air. And they can also take a little bit of oxygen through their skin. Um, and so they've, they've uh, developed a really nice life history strategy to, to survive short droughts. Now, if that drought extends, they're not gonna be able to survive long periods of time, but they can get through short periods um, in those ponds. The other kind of neat thing about the sirens is that they are capable of rudimentary vocalization. Uh, so uh, researchers in the further south, in the southeastern uh, part of the U.S. where these are much more common critters, have put underwater microphones into the water and they make clicking noises. And that's how it's hypothesized anyway that they uh, can communicate with one another uh, likely for reproductive purposes, um, but that's still a little understood. But yep, they are capable of rudimentary vocalizations, which, that's is, really cool. which is really cool. Yeah, people don't think typically think of uh, uh, salamanders making noise. We always think of the, the amphibians, we think of the frogs with their frog calls, exactly. but there are certain species of salamanders that, that are capable of this uh, basic uh, vocalization. So those are our pond breeders. Uh, so we went through, so we had the spotted salamander, the smallmouth, and mole salamander, the marbled salamander, and the lesser siren. Um, then we move into the stream, examples of the stream salamanders. And for that we've got two different examples, and I pulled them in the container. Here, on this side we have the cave salamander. Really, really pretty, um, bright orange with those distinct black spots all across the body. And then hiding over here in the moss, if we can 
get him. That's the long tail salamander. And they look pretty similar. They as well. they do, yeah. So if you look at those bodies, they're really pencil thin, similar coloration, even similar spotting. You really got to pay attention. So on the tail of the the long tail salamander, see if I can get him to cooperate. You can actually see those kind of chevrons. So the spots kind of turn into those chevrons where that is not the case on that cave salamander. So mm -hmm. spots throughout. These are in the same genus. So uh -huh. this is Eurycia lucifica and Eurycia longicata. And you'll find them in the same habitats. Now, cave salamanders are a little bit more specialized as their name implies. Uh, you typically find them in caves, wet rock faces, um, high quality springs. Um, and the, the long tail salamander are a little bit more indicative of just nice headwater streams. But where those two habitats kind of come together, which would be the case for, for caves moving, uh, that flow into streams, you'll get both of these species. Now I mentioned they're stream breeders, and, and the reason I mention that is that they have similar strategies to the pond breeders, most of the pond breeders, in that they go to these aquatic habitats, they lay the eggs in the water, they develop and then they hatch out and you have aquatic larvae. And then after a period of a couple of months, those larvae are going to metamorphose and move out into the terrestrial habitat. So when we think about most of these amphibians, they need, they have what we call a biphasic lifestyle, where they have both an aquatic stage and a terrestrial stage. So they need nice aquatic habitats and nice terrestrial habitats. But the last example doesn't need that. So up here, down here, we have a slimy salamander. The slimy salamander is fully terrestrial which means they do not need water, uh, standing water, like a pond, or moving water like a stream for reproductive purposes. They lay their eggs terrestrially, and those eggs develop them in the terrestrial habitat, and basically the larval cycle happens within the egg. When the egg hatches, you just have a very, very tiny version of a slimy sound. Now, they still require high quality forested habitat, and the reason why, Slimy salamanders are found in the family Plethodontidae, as are the, our, our two species of stream breeders, the Eurycia uh, longicauda and Lucifaga, uh, long tail in the cave salamander, are found in the Plethodontidae. Those are all lungless animals. They do not have lungs of any type, which means they don't breathe like you and I do. They get all of their oxygen through their skin, and so they carry on that respiratory process through the skin, which means they need cool habitats that are very moist because those are going to be oxygen rich habitats in order, to, uh, in order for them to survive. So they're very, very susceptible to desiccation. They can dry out very easily. And so if we think about habitat changes for whatever reason, so you log a forest or if you think about climate change and you increase the temperature, that means moisture goes down. That also means oxygen goes down for them they're not able to survive those, those, those changes. And so uh, a pretty unique feature, but ironically enough, that's the most common type of salamander. So the lungless salamanders um, radiated originally, so if we think about this um, in evolutionary time, they radiated from the Southern Appalachian region. Uh, and to this day, the Southern Appalachian region of the United States is the center of diversity for salamanders in the world. Uh, the only other place that would be close would be uh, southern Mexico and northern Guatemala. So you're saying that they have to have like high quality streams and forests. Mm -hmm. um, um, for people who don't know like, what that would necessarily mean, like what does it mean? Lots of rocks, lots of moving water, uh, and lots of aquatic macroinvertebrates, so little bugs that they can feed on. Uh, they need to be completely shaded by uh, the forest canopy, so you have uh, cooler waters, cooler temperatures, um, and then lots and lots of what we scientists call interstitial spaces. Those are basically cracks and crevices, things that they can hide in um, from other predators that, that you're going to find in the stream. Kind of like this would be. Exactly. And so if you think about this, this is, this is similar to what a cave salamander would be found on if it were wet. 
all of these cracks and crevices would be places that they can hide and have protection um, from predators. And then like, like we talked about with the pond breeding amphibians, absence of fish. And so as you move into bigger streams where you start to get fish, you'll no longer get these stream breeding type of, uh, types of salamanders because again, they're, they, they just uh, they get decimated by the, the predatory nature of those fish. So when they're looking for streams, they look for like a much shallower stream. Absolutely, yeah. And so we call those things headwater streams. So those are the streams that, that pop up first on a landscape. And so in a lot of instances, they're no bigger than the size of a sidewalk. Um, and they will have intermittent flows and so in certain periods the, there will be flowing water in other periods there will not but there'll be little pools that will still form where they'll have access to the water that they need um, but again it's something that a fish wouldn't be able to persist in because there wouldn't be enough water um, over the long term for them to survive so uh, you study these salamanders I just so what is what all do you use salamanders for studying? That's a good question. So one of the things we can use salamanders for is almost this idea that, that, that people talk a, a lot about. It's a canary in the coal mine. And what that means is they're really good indicators of environmental quality and environmental health. And so if we, we think about the landscape and we think about needing clean water and, and healthy forests for, for carbon dioxide uptake, things like that, the salamanders really act as this kind of thermometer barometer where they tell us how well those environments are doing. Um, and so what we tend to see is whenever a habitat starts to undergo degradation, um, and we, we, we see a, a decline in the salamanders. So you look at population sizes over time and if they start dropping or if species start disappearing, that's a pretty good indication that there's something wrong in that system. Uh, and, and certainly in this day and age where clean water is a, a really important topic, these guys tell us a lot about that uh, because they need really, really nice environments with clean water. You will not find most of these salamanders um, in polluted environments. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really good way to assess the health of ecosystems and, and, and how these uh, various habitats are functioning. So thank you so much for telling us about your research and these salamanders here. Absolutely. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirk. And as always, I'll see you next week.